Welcome back to Documenting the Deal, Venture Capital Law. I'm your host for today, Professor Seth Orenberg, and this is the second in a three-part series on the topic. I want to thank Therese Maynard and Dana Warren for producing an excellent casebook. This lecture is based on their casebook and their materials, and I suggest you check it out. This is meant to be a supplement for students in the course. What are we going to talk about today? Well, first, let's recap what we learned last time. If you haven't watched that video, please click the link and go back to see that video. Last video, we went through the life cycle of a venture capital deal, starting with preliminaries to pursuing venture capital, like going on Shark Tank and pitching to the sharks, then the delivery of the term sheet, which begins the process where lawyers get involved. The process of due diligence, how the results of the diligence will affect and impact the disclosure schedule, which covers the representations and warranties and the exceptions thereto from the stock purchase agreement. We talked about the relationship between those representations and warranties, and when they're really important, they get elevated to conditions of closing. And the lawyer's job in creating the schedule of exceptions, also known as the disclosure schedule. The remainder of the videos will go into detail on what is usually in the documents themselves. So it's going to get a little technical today, but hang in there. We're going to cover some important stuff. So in this part two, we're going to take an overview of preferred stock, and we're going to look at the dividend preference, the liquidation preference, conversion rights, and anti-dilution protections. We're going to review in detail these mechanics of liquidation and dividend preferences. These are the fundamental financial rights, and uh, preferred stock will often have these features, and it will allow us to introduce the dual quality of preferred stock, which gives it a debt-like priority position. You get paid before the common stock, but like the common stock, you have control. You get to vote for the directors and have a role in corporate governance that debt holders do not have. Then we're going to come back to this in the third video and talk about some remaining aspects of preferred stock rights. First off, why are we issuing equity at all? Let's talk about the decision of debt versus equity. What is a loan? A loan is a type of debt where you make fixed payments over time. You're going to pay a certain amount of principal and a certain amount of interest back on a regular schedule. Whereas with equity, you don't actually pay it back. Another person now owns a piece of your business, a percentage of your enterprise. Why choose one over the other? Well, loans can be hard for startups to pay back when they don't have any money coming in. Many startups will lose money or at least not make revenue for many years. So a loan will be hard to pay back. And if you don't pay back your loan, you will end up in bankruptcy. That's bad news for the startup. So we look at the equity side of the ledger and we could have much higher returns for the investors and lower risk for the company. We're not going to go into bankruptcy. There's nothing that we have to pay back. For a pre-cash company, equity is pretty much the only option with one small exception, convertible debt, which effectively bridges the time period before you're ready to take on a full-blown equity investment. What is convertible debt? It is a type of security, an instrument, that has debt features, but is really not meant to be paid back. So you might have very low interest rates or very flexible terms of repayment, but at a triggering event, such as another stock financing with a professional venture capital investor, that convertible debt will turn into the next series of preferred stock. Now, why are we using preferred stock? Common stock is the ordinary stock, the stock that the founders themselves have issued to themselves. So what is common stock? Well, in the context of public companies, the ones you might see on NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange, common stock is a security with residual rights to earnings and assets and usually comes with voting rights. So what does that mean to have residual rights? It means that you get whatever is left over. You're at the bottom of the pecking order. And that's one of the reasons that common stock has those voting rights, because you might not want the company to take on 
certain debts that would put other people in a higher priority position above you. Preferred stock is a bit different. It's more akin to debt because it often has mandatory dividend and liquidation preferences, a limited defined return. It may or may not be convertible to common stock, and it may or may not have voting rights. In the case of a public company, it almost never is convertible, almost never has voting rights. It's a little different in our private company context, as we'll see in just a minute. In the context of private companies who are financed by venture capitalists, preferred stock is a supersized bonus better version of common stock. It has everything of common stock and more. It is better in every way because fundamentally it is convertible into common stock. So you can have all the common stock rights. Plus there are many preferences that sit on top of that. It is these special rights, the more, the better, the reason that investors want it. It is the preferences that we're going to discuss in this video and subsequent video. So why are we going to sell preferred stock to investors? Why can't we just raise money by selling common stock? Let's go to Sand Hill Road in Palo Alto, California, and knock on some venture capital's doors and ask them to purchase common stock. Will this work? Well, probably not. Venture capitalists put a lot of money at risk, and in exchange, they want some preferences over the common holders in three main areas. They want to have more earnings. They want to have better access to the assets, and they want to have control to make sure that the founders who might actually own a larger percentage of overall stock don't run the company to the benefit of the management and not for the shareholders. Venture capitalists in particular want the ability to get their money out first, and they're willing to pay a premium for these rights. So you can sell common stock for less than you can sell preferred stock. The preferred stock has more value. And so we're going to sell preferred stock to the investors. We're going to infuse the company with more cash, and they're going to get the control that they want. Because we charge a premium price, we don't have to sell as many shares. We don't have to give up as much percentage of the company as we would if we sold common. So it is the better bet all around. The distinctive attributes that we need to discuss in detail and that we will discuss in detail in this video discussion are dividend preferences, liquidation preferences, and conversion rights and anti-dilution protections. So let's get started by talking about dividends. What is a dividend? A dividend is a distribution of cash or sometimes other assets, but usually cash to the shareholders. And it's a way for the shareholders to share in the company's profits. So a very profitable company may issue a special dividend when it has some cash sitting around and it will distribute that to the shareholders. Lawyers, there are some laws you need to be aware about that pertain to the issuance of dividends in Delaware. A company that is incorporated in Delaware is subject to Delaware law and under Delaware law, Dividends cannot be paid if they would result in the company's liabilities exceeding its assets. In California, a company that is in California and is subject to California pursuant to their long-arm statute or is incorporated in California, dividends cannot be paid if they would impair the capital of the company. A balance sheet test is required by Chapter 5 of the California Corporate Code. So look up those codes before you issue dividends or advise your clients to issue dividends. Why are we doing this? Why are we restricting these payments? It is to protect creditors and focus on the rule of absolute priority. Does it even make sense to talk about dividends in a startup? An early stage company, as I mentioned, is probably not making money, maybe losing money. And so dividends are almost certainly not a practical alternative. Now, you may be asking if dividend rights are not going to be exercised, for the most part, why are they granted? Why are we even talking about it? Even though a company is not going to distribute dividends anytime soon, there are reasons why preferred stockholders want dividend rights. For one thing, it gives them an enhanced preferential position and thus protects preferred holders from abuse by common holders because this gives them a claim on more of the company's assets. And... Relatedly, they increase the financial return to the preferred stock upon certain events. So even though those dividends 
don't get paid until a liquidation event or another event happens. When those events happen, then those dividends should come through and inure to the benefit of the preferred stockholders. So let's spend a few minutes talking about the preferred stock dividend rights typically found in VC financings that are going to focus on implementing these two business objectives. Those objectives again being giving the preferred holders an additional preference, preventing cash from leaking out of the company. Uh, and I should also mention that that's partly because usually preferred stock has a right to be paid first. So if there's a dividend issued to the common, it must also be paid to the preferred, prevents the management from simply dividending themselves. And second, increasing the financial return to the preferred stock investors. There are two elements of dividends that should be considered here. First is priority. And next we'll talk about participation. What is priority? Dividend priority preference, for example, will be found in a company's charter. And will provide something to the effect of no dividend shall be declared on the common stock until each share of the preferred stock has received a dividend equal to blank. And so this is going to prevent the management from issuing dividends to themselves, often the common shareholders, at the expense of the preferred stockholders. Other language might read something like, no dividend shall be paid on the common stock during any given year until the preferred stock have been paid a dividend in that year of X dollar per share. So priority right to dividends is an important feature of preferred stock. Our dividend priorities usually included in a venture capital financing? Yes, priority dividends are customary. You will usually find something like six to 10% of the original issue price of the preferred stock must be paid in dividends to the preferred stockholders first before the common stockholders can receive a dividend. And the charter usually also prohibits the repurchase of common stock. Why would this be inserted in the charter? This again goes back to the basic purpose of the priority right. We want to pay the money out to the preferred shareholders first before any distributions, including what can come about through a stock repurchase, are paid to the common stockholders. Now that was priority. Let's talk about participation. A participation right means that after the preferred stock is paid the amount of its dividend priority, the preferred stock then participates, receives any dividend that's declared on the common stock on an as converted basis. It doesn't have to actually be converted, although as I mentioned, the preferred stock in VC financings is usually convertible preferred stock, but it's treated as if it had converted and receives a share of any dividend issued to common holders. That is a participating dividend. A non-participating dividend means that when a dividend is declared on common stock, the preferred shares must still be paid first but then the company simply pays the common holders without any further distributions to the preferred stock. Thus, the preferred stock does not participate in the additional dividend distribution. It still gets its priority distribution, but it doesn't also get the subsequent participating distribution along with the common. Our casebook offered some sample language. It read, after the payment of the priority dividend amount, any additional dividends shall be paid to the holders of the preferred stock and the common stock pro rata based on the number of common stock then outstanding, assuming conversion is full of the preferred stock, uh, con conversion in full of the preferred stock. So we're going to treat it as if it were converted to common. That is a participating preference that I just read to you there from that sample charter. So what does this do to the preferred shareholders? Well, it prevents circumvention of the first money rights of the preferred stock. It means the company cannot pay only, let's say, 8% to the preferred and then distribute millions, whatever percent that may be, to the common stock. Dividend priority and participation, therefore, work together. So the preferred stock gets paid first and also gets a share of whatever the common gets paid thus giving the preferred stock an interest in the residual value of the company like the common shareholders expect to have. Note that priority right is based on the number of preferred shares outstanding and their original per share price, while participation right is based on something different. The participation right is not based on the number of shares outstanding, but the number of shares that the preferred stock would convert to if it converted to common, and that number can change. 
It's the first of several examples of the dual nature of venture capital stock. It has a priority right like debt and a participation right like common stock. Are participation dividends common in Silicon Valley? Yes, they are extremely common. You would expect to find participating preferred preferences. What's the financial effect? Let's take a look at the financial effect under two different scenarios. One where we have something called cumulative dividends and one when we have non-cumulative dividends. Let's talk about that. We have to define a few terms first. When a dividend is quote unquote declared, that means the company obligates itself to pay a dividend. Now, later when that dividend is actually paid, well, we use the term paid for that, but declared and paid are different. An accrued or accumulated dividend is in that in-between state. It has accrued when it is declared, but not yet paid. Now let's talk about cumulative and non-cumulative. Cumulative means the priority dividend amount is accumulated from one year to the next if it's not paid. A certain percentage that is on the stock, let's say it's 8%, you're supposed to receive 8% of the investment every year. And so if it's not paid in year one, you'll receive that amount in year two plus the amount owed for year two. A cumulative dividend functions as though it is automatically declared. So it accumulates or accrues on a compounding basis until it is paid. And so the priority preference automatically grows. What would an example of language that provides for a cumulative dividend look like? Well, an example in the case book is the holders of the preferred stock shall be entitled to annual dividends in an amount equal to 8% of one, the original purchase price of the preferred stock, plus two, all dividends then accrued or accumulated prior to and in preference to any dividend payment to common stockholders. That language reflects a cumulative dividend because it will accrue year over year. These dividends compound annually because the dividend rate is multiplied by the original issue price plus all dividends then accrued. If there is no compounding, then all dividends then accrued is not part of the calculation. So that can be a distinction between those two different features. Non-cumulative means the dividend priority amount expires if it's not declared, and if it is declared but not paid, it does not compound or bear interest while it is accruing absent specific language. So if a dividend preference is non-cumulative and a dividend is not declared by a board in a given year, that dividend right or preference for the year expires. That's why it's not cumulative. It expires if it isn't declared. You don't get it automatically. Now, if dividends are declared, and paid, a non-cumulative dividend priority preference gives the preferred shares a distribution ahead of any of the funds to common shares, but it is not, unlike with cumulative, it is not automatically declared. But again, you might ask, if dividends are never going to be declared in a startup anyway, since it has no revenues or profits, why does it matter if the right is cumulative? Well, it's possible in the future, the company will actually make money. Uh, I understand that Spotify, 10 years after it's been found, might actually become profitable uh, in the near future. So holding preferred stock with dividend preferences can become valuable later and result in a major payout if it's a substantial cumulative dividend. In addition, very often the preferred stock's liquidation preference will require that the amount due, including any accrued but unpaid dividends, will be paid in the event of a liquidation, like a sale of the company, and that will be paid to the preferred holders. So this is the first of several significant points about preferred stock. This dividend preference is a huge advantage to venture capital investors. There is, however, a important financial disadvantage. So tax attorneys, get ready for this one. Venture capital investors can have income tax liability for cumulative dividends. Even if they have not been paid, they have simply uh, accrued and they may be resulting in income tax liability. Check this issue with your local tax expert. What's the market on cumulative dividends? Well, the data currently is that no more than 5 to 10% of West Coast venture capital deals use them, but they are included in up to half of the East Coast deals, so we see a bit of a split here. A common perception is that venture capital terms on the East Coast are more debt-like than the West Coast, and you can see how cumulative dividends operate very much like interest payments. 
And so the regional practices of treating preferred, which has debt and common features, more like debt would imply that there would be cumulative dividends. And we do see that on the East Coast, much more on the West Coast, where it is treated more similar to common stock. The additional preferences that we will discuss in coming talks are voting rights and redemption rights. Next, let's move on to liquidation preference, another financial right. What is a liquidation preference? A liquidation preference is the preference given to preferred stockholders regarding a distribution of the company's assets upon a sale of the company or other dissolution. We'll talk about specific triggering events that can cause a liquidation to occur in a minute. Now, with dividend preferences and with liquidation preferences, they are divided into priority and participation rights. A liquidation priority preference generally is based on the preferred stock's original purchase price or some multiple of that price, plus accrued but unpaid dividends. Just like in the case of uh, dividends, a liquidation priority has to do with what the investor paid for the shares. This is a debt-like feature, and so it has to do with the amount of the investment. Whereas when we get to participation, we talk about that as converted concept. And we're going to talk a little more about how to calculate that as converted number as well. Why do venture capital investors insist on a liquidation priority preference? It is very common to have a liquidation preference. Why would this be required? It is how VCs ensure that when a company is not the 10,000 X return they hoped it would be, they at least get their money back before anyone else gets paid, before the common shareholders at least get paid. As with a dividend preference, VCs want their money back before the common shareholders get any proceeds from the sale. That also prevents an agency problem where the common shareholders who run the company might try to sell it at a time when it's not beneficial for the investors. So what terms do VCs usually want and usually get? Well, the priority preference is usually equal to the original purchase price of the stock, which would be a 1x liquidation preference, plus accrued but unpaid dividends. But in more difficult situations, maybe 20% of transactions out there, it will be a multiple, a multiple liquidation preference, such as 2x of the original purchase price. In more difficult economic times, when it is harder to get venture capital money, the VCs will extract some of that value by charging a multiple priority preference on liquidation. There are three different types of liquidation preferences, non-participating, capped participating, and fully participating. And this again, participation is a concept that we just discussed and it is similar to how it works in the dividend context. Let's start with non-participating. How does that work? With a non-participating preference, once the liquidation priority preference gets paid, the preferred shareholders get nothing else. They only get their preferred liquidation preference. That means they have a priority right and no participation right. That's why it's called non-participating. They get their preferred priority, but they don't get to participate. It's non-participating. How does a capped participating liquidation preference work? That means once the liquidation priority has been paid on the preferred stock, it shares its additional proceeds on a pro rata as converted basis until each share of preferred has received some amount but no more of what's left over. So let's say the shareholders, let's say that there is a million dollars of liquidation preference and a participation right that's capped at a million dollars. The venture capitalist under this situation cannot receive more than two million, no matter how much the company is sold for. In the non-participating example, they get one million. They didn't participate in that second round. In the capped example, they get up to two million, depending on how much is left. Now, a fully participating liquidation preference is much better for them if they end up with 20% of a company that sells for $100 million because they'll actually get a share of the entire amount. So what is a fully participating liquidation preference? That means once the liquidation priority preference is paid on preferred shares, the preferred shares acts like common stock and as an unconverted pro rata basis gets the same distributions that the common stock does. That means they get their priority and a full participation with no cap. Liquidation participation rights, therefore, do not usually involve the actual conversion of preferred stock into common, but 
If there is a participation right, they will be treated on an as-converted basis. As we saw with dividends, liquidation priority rights are based on the per share price of the preferred stock, while participation rights are based on the number of common shares the preferred stock can be converted into. And again, we need to talk about how to calculate that as converted number. In addition, the preferred stock does not get to convert in the middle of a liquidation. The preferred stockholders decide before the liquidation whether they wish to go through that process as preferred holders or as common holders. They can actually convert to common holders as well if that is financially better for them. Why do you think, uh, which do you think venture capitalists prefer? Well, of course, they prefer a fully participating liquidation preference. It clearly offers the best return. What do companies prefer and the founders? Well, they prefer non-participating. It re represents an either or choice. You either get your preferred priority or you get to convert into common. You don't get the priority and the participation. Now, that is a more clear choice, but obviously economically it's not as strong for the venture capitalists. So what do they end up getting? Most VC funds in a non-distressed deal will accept a capped participation at 2x to 4x, meaning they get their priority preference and then they participate with the common until they receive an amount equal to whatever that multiple is. Right? If it's twice, then that's 2x participation. Uh, as a multiple of their original purchase price. So they invested a million, they get their million dollars, and then they participate. Let's say it's a 2x cap, they'll get another 2 million, and that's it. That's the end of their participation. So what triggers one of these events? When do we have a payment of the liquidation preference? It is triggered by something called a liquidation event, and that will be defined in the deal documents, but it usually includes the dissolution of the company or a merger and sale, uh, a merger of the company when it's acquired or a sale of all or substantially all of its assets. Any essentially final disposition will trigger this liquidation preference, but it's an important term in the deal documents. I mentioned that preferred stock can generally convert. In fact, VCs almost always purchase convertible preferred stock, which means it can be exchanged in a common stock at any time at their discretion. They may do this for a number of reasons. Let's talk about that conversion right because it obviously makes a big difference when determining what participation looks like. It doesn't factor into priority because remember, priority is going to be based on the original purchase price, but as the company goes on, the amount of shares that one preferred stock will convert into, the number of common shares one preferred stock will get will convert into can change. So when you're dealing with a convertible security, it's critical to remember that the right to convert is not intended to be contingent on later authorization of common shares. Those common shares must be available all the time and they should be built into the authorized capital structure. So if you have a converting preferred, that means there needs to be some authorized but not issued common stock effectively sitting in the bank, in theory, uh, waiting to be issued upon that conversion. We don't need a charter amendment to do that. Now, moving on, let's talk about the two types of conversion and then we'll talk about the conversion rate. The two types of conversion are voluntary and mandatory, also known as automatic. A voluntary conversion says that the preferred stockholder may, at its election, convert its preferred stock into common stock. This is establishing a fundamental right to convert, and this is what makes it convertible. In addition to establishing the right to convert, a charter usually describes a procedure for exercising that right. It usually entails notice to the company and surrender of the preferred stock certificates. If you're a VC, when would you choose to voluntarily convert your shares into common stock? Well, maybe your shares have a capped liquidation preference or no participation preference, and the liquidation proceeds are high enough that the cap is reached and the value of the shares are higher if you simply share in the residual with the common as opposed to taking your liquidation priority or your liquidation participation at the cap. And so you will convert the shares in order to get the same value that the common will get. What if a company is going public? Growth companies rarely register their preferred stock for trading, but investment bankers view having preferred stock outstanding as an impediment to the value of the common and therefore negative for a public offering. So in these cases where a company is going public, 
the company may have a requirement that the preferred stock converts. You're not going to register the preferred stock. It's a liability. It will diminish the value of the preferred stock and make it harder to have a good value going public. And so there may be a mandatory conversion upon an initial public offering. So there are two situations where preferred shareholders are typically required to convert. The first, as I mentioned, is a qualified public offering. That means there has to be a minimum price per share, a minimum offering size. These are terms that are negotiated. Why do you think VCs insist on it being qualified? Well, automatic conversion means that they receive none of their preferred rights going forward. They simply become common holders. If a public offering could have a, uh, an effect like this, when it's not really a public offering, but something that was orchestrated in order to squeeze them out, they'd be in a bad position. So they qualify what a public offering is. The minimum share price ensures the public offering will be higher than the price paid by their preferred stock, and the higher value justifies giving up their preference. The second is going to be upon approval of a majority or sometimes a supermajority of the preferred shares. So this is kind of like a drag along, right? And upon approval by a sufficient number of preferred shares, all the preferred shares must convert into common stock. Why would preferred shareholders want this? Well, it allows the consensus of the group, whatever that group is based on the voting standard, to compel all preferred shareholders to act together on conversion in circumstances where the conclusion is that terminating the preferred shock stock rights is the best course of action for the entire company. And so this can happen in a number of situations uh, where it's simply better for the company and the, the venture capitalists uh, who hold the majority of the supermajority can force this to happen. This would not work if it required a unanimous vote because it would give every preferred stockholder a veto and the veto power is one major issue in VC financing. So typically the conversion upon approval, the mandatory conversion on approval is essentially at the election of a majority or a super majority. Let's talk next about dilution, dilution. Dilution at its most basic is the reduction in the percentage ownership that will occur to all shareholders when any new shares are issued. Company has 100 shares, you have 10 shares, how many percent of shares do you have? You have 10 out of 100, that's 10%. The company issues another 100 shares to somebody else. Now you have 10 out of 200, that's 5%, and you've been diluted. Is that bad? Well, it could be bad. It could be good because now the company has uh, sold those shares for value and you might have a smaller piece of a bigger, more valuable pie. Dilution is normal. It's something to be expected in the life cycle of a venture capital-backed company. It could be a good thing. It is a good thing when a new share is issued to reflect an increase in the value of the company. The existing holders would own a smaller percentage of the total, but the value of what they own will have increased. If the company used a stockholder's effective investment effectively in building its business, the investment will increase the value of the business. And when new shares are issued, they'll command a higher price. And this is good dilution. For example, assume that a VC fund makes an investment. Later, a new investor invests in the same company at a higher price. That means the new investor paid more dollars per share, and it means fewer shares were issued per dollar raised. Since the new investor's per share price is the value per share imputed on the first investor's stock, the first investor's stock value is higher than at price it paid. It's showing that the value of the company went up. The additional share issuance dilutes the first investor's percentage ownership, but the increased price means the shares are worth more, and the investor ends up with a smaller piece of a bigger and more valuable pie. And that's good dilution. Now, there can be bad dilution, and let's first talk about bad dilution in the context of the participation right. The first type of bad dilution will occur if the company makes changes to the common stock that affect the value of the participation right as the, of the preferred, such as the participating dividends, participation liquidation rights, or voting. What are some examples of these changes to common stock? How can the common stock change to negatively affect the value of the participation right of the preferred? A stock split, a stock dividend, uh, a reverse split can affect it. So to protect the preferred stock's participation right, the charter will usually have a provision that will adjust the conversion price proportionately. Adjust the conversion rate in the event these changes are made to common stock. The objective 
is to ensure that upon conversion to common stock, the preferred stock is treated the same as it would have been if the change to the common stock was not made. We can also have a dilution that does negatively affect the economic value of the preferred stock, and this happens in something called a down round. In Series A, the shares are sold for a dollar. In Series B, they're sold for two. Yay! Ah, bad though if the shares are sold for 50 cents in Series B. What happens if they're sold for 50 cents? It means the company has gone down in value. And so a down round that can cause bad dilution is when a company issues stock at a lower price than what a preferred investor originally paid. It means the company is not meeting its milestones, not progressing at its rate that the earlier investor anticipated. It's a real problem because the analysis of potential future values are now all invalid. And from the point of the view of the previous investor, the company induced it to place a higher valuation on the company at the time of its investment than the company really deserves. With 2020 hindsight, the investor realizes that it overpaid. It bought too few shares with its dollars, and consequently its ownership position is too small. So a venture capitalist can protect itself about getting the price wrong in this concept by insisting that the economic value or price be protected with an anti-dilution protection that would be included in the charter terms of the Series A preferred stock. This kind of anti-dilution is triggered when a company sells securities at a price below the conversion price of the existing preferred shares. And as we've seen, a preferred stock's conver conversion price is normally its original issuance price. So if you sell stock for a dollar in round A and 50 cents in round B, that will trigger anti-dilution protection. Price anti-dilution protection always results in the conversion price of the existing preferred stock being adjusted downward, which means that the number of shares that it gets when it converts to common will increase. The effect is to increase the number of common stock equivalents that that set of preferred represents, so it won't be a one-to-one -one ratio anymore. This type of anti-dilution comes in two forms, and the form used is a point of negotiation. The two types are called weighted average formula and a ratchet. Let's talk about the two forms of anti-dilution protection. First, we'll talk about a ratchet price protection. A ratchet price protection is the most common form of anti-dilution protection for value. And the clearest example would be a full ratchet, and it is the simplest example. A full ratchet adjustment is whenever the company sells a security below the existing preferred stock's conversion price, that stock's conversion price is automatically adjusted to equal the price of the new security. So you get whatever the next guy gets. And so the stock that you paid a dollar for and next round it sold for 50 cents, now you get to buy two shares of common instead of one for every dollar that you spent. And so that is called a full ratchet. Now this is an onerous adjustment because it does not take into account several important things like the size of the new issuance or the dilutive impact of the overall capitalization. A full ratchet is really too advantageous to the old investors and as a result, it can stymie new investors from coming in at that down round. And a failing company that really needs the help in the down round does not want to be in a position where people are not interested in investing. Let me give you an example. Venture capital investor one invested $5 million at a $5 million pre-money valuation with 5 million shares outstanding. As a result, that VC paid $1 per share. And as is typical, the conversion rate usually starts at one to one, and so its Series A preferred stock has a conversion price of one dollar per share. Right, so you invested five million at a five million valuation with five million shares, you have one dollar per share, and you can convert each of those five million shares, you can convert all five million to five million common at a one to one ratio. So let's assume the VC has full ratchet protection. Softco, uh, for the company, falls on hard times and now proposes to raise additional financing by selling $5 million worth of shares at $0.50 cents per share, not a dollar, $0.50, cents, half as much. The conversion price of VC1's preferred stock would be lowered to $0.50, cents, meaning that for each dollar that they spent, they can now buy two shares of common stock or 10 million shares of common stock. A full ratchet adjusts the conversion price to the issuance of new stock. 
A weighted average formula is a bit more complicated. Let's start by looking at how a weighted average formula works. In a weighted average formula, anti-dilution adjustment. Upon the issuance of new stock at a lower price than the existing stock's conversion price, the conversion price will be lowered of that existing stock. The conversion price will be lowered based on a formula that's meant to take into account the dilutive event on the total capitalization of the company. A full ratchet was too beneficial to the old investor. So a weighted average is going to take into account the fact that the new investment is diluting the company. There are two types of weighted average anti-dilution formulas. One is called narrow base, the other is called broad base. Let's talk about them with a little specificity. A narrow based formula for weighted average anti-dilution restricts the number of common shares that are counted as outstanding. A typical approach is to count only common stock that's actually outstanding, ignoring as converted shares, meaning ignoring the preferred. A second but less common approach is to treat as outstanding only the preferred stock in question on an as converted basis and all the securities issued since it has been outstanding. The formula must be specified. In contrast, a broad-based formula counts all common stock equivalents. It actually uses all outstanding common stock plus anything outstanding that is convertible into common stock, and that would include warrants, options, notes, other preferred stock. Which formula would our client, the company, prefer? The company would prefer to be as broad as possible because the broader the formula, that makes the left half of the fraction larger, reducing the potential adjustments to the preferred stock, showing effectively more impact. Counting more shares as outstanding makes the new issuance relatively smaller in size and therefore less dilutive. What about existing investors? They would prefer to be narrow because it would increase the adjustment. Fewer shares would be counted, the new issuance is larger in size, and therefore a narrow approach would be better for the existing investors. A broad-based formula places the dilutive transaction in the context of the total capital structure, and that is potentially too broad, right? This is what the VCs will argue at least. Why is it too broad? Because it makes the preferred investor's own investment count against it in calculating the weighting, weighted average. A narrow-based formula decreases the weight part of the formula. It's difficult to understand the rationale for limiting it to common stock, so usually things like warrants and incentive plan will be included, but not the investor's existing stock on an as-converted basis. Most investors, at least about 95% in Silicon Valley, do use broad-based weighted average formula anti-dilution protections. If a full ratchet's used, it usually has a time limit on it, so you don't get that benefit forever, one or two years. These adjustments are price protections. They're kind of a, almost a warranty. So a price guarantee should be defined for some period of time, but it will not last forever. And a ratchet, if it's used, can be dangerous because a very small issuance that has no real impact can dramatically change the conversion price. It has no nothing to do with how many new shares are issued. So a broad-based weighted average has been sort of agreed on, at least in Silicon Valley, as the correct way to have anti-dilution protections. Finally, when do these protections come about? Economic value or price protection anti-dilutions are triggered when there is a new share issuance at a lower per share price than the conversion price of existing preferred stock. Now that does deserve a little unpacking. For one thing, what are additional shares? Usually the charter will define an additional share and it will say something to the effect of any issuance of common stock or of any security that is convertible, exchangeable, or exercisable into common stock constitutes the issuance of additional shares of common stock. That term is typically used in the anti-dilution adjustment provision, and that covers the issuance of preferred stock. The additional shares definition typically provides a long list of exempt issuances that do not trigger. These are called carve-outs. So what are these carve-outs? Not everything is going to trigger this. Carve-outs include events that are previously taken into account, particularly small issuances. Issuances that are approved by the preferred stockholders, they can effectively waive 
their, their right to get this anti-dilution protection. Let's look at a few specifics and see if they would be triggered. How about shares issued upon a stock split? Shares issued on a stock split. Well, again, we have to look at the, at the precise charter. All of these require looking at the charter. Maybe the charter says the issuance is addressed by a separate provision. As you mentioned, a stock split could be the issuance of additional shares, but we usually have protections for that that are elsewhere. So we would not want to give double protection for those. The charter will probably contain a carve out for a stock split. How about shares issued in a qualified public offering? Well, normally the preferred stock converts automatically on a qualified public offering. So this issue would be addressed in that section of automatic mandatory conversion. What about shares issued on conversion of the preferred stock? Uh, so someone actually converts their preferred stock. This would be included in the capitalization. This already isn't counted in the value. And so this does not change the economics of the company there. Shares issued in acquisition. Well, it could be covered by the carve out for small transactions. It could be covered by, the, by a transaction that requires approval of the preferred stock. In any event, you need to read the charter carefully to avoid being surprised by an issuance that triggers an adjustment as a result of a carve out that works differently than expected. Up next, we'll talk about redemption rights and voting rights in the next video. And that will conclude our discussion about the common rights that you need to understand to understand how preferred stock works in venture capital transactions. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Professor Seth Orenberg, and I'll catch you on the next video.